Hey, robot makers, hope you're having a good day so far. So let me get my notes up here. <laughs> I can do this intro properly. So do you want to make a cute 3D printable humanoid robot that can run on MicroPython? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name is Kevin. Come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. OK, let's get over to our keynote and we can make a start. And I can introduce you to Chip, <laughs> who's the, uh, the latest robot that I've designed. So I'm going to tell you about the uh, the inspiration and the idea behind this, why I designed it. I'm going to show you the different electronic parts that you need for this. Uh, we're going to have a look at some of the uh, designs in Fusion 360. And uh, this is going to be a bit more of a fu fu Fusion 360 episode today. Uh, we're going to have a look at some future plans. Um, how to follow a line. I think that may be from last week. I should have edited that out. This is how to uh, um, to make it do some really interesting things. And of course, we're going to have a live stream uh, Q&A mailbox chat after the, uh, the main part of the show. So if you're watching this live, you can hang out for that bit too. Okay, so let's get straight to it, shall we? So what's the inspiration and the idea behind this robot? So he's going to do an Iron Man-like maneuver now. <laughs> So I wanted to build a small bipedal robot uh, for experimenting with, for walking and doing sort of all kinds of gestures. And I also wanted to make one that's similar to Plen, if you've seen that. Um, Roboson or Robosapien, I think is another one. Easy Robot. They're all very, very similar. They have almost the same number of servos inside. They tend to be very expensive to buy. Um, and some of them are 3D printable. Some of them you sort of buy as a you know complete robot. Uh, and I thought it'd be good to have a play with this, design one myself, and then I got my own little companion robot. And I was also thinking um, it could sit on my shoulder. Uh, be this is before I'd... I'd um, I'd named him and then I thought about this uh, sitting on the shoulder thing. Uh, so he could just sit there sort of swinging his legs and sort of pointing at various things and looking around. Uh, and uh, I called him Chip and then it occurred to me Chip on the shoulder. <laughs> I don't know. I like puns. I like dad jokes. So this was part of the, the inspiration for this. I just wanted to have one of these. So it does require 19 servos and servos can be pretty expensive. You can buy these... Um, SG90 type. Uh, these are quite like transparent uh, blue plastic and they are plastic gears. But I prefer these DS929 servos uh, which look like this. These are digital servos. Uh, they have a metal gear and they're just an all round better quality but they are more expensive. So they cost about £9, £10 each with shipping. So I'll do the math on that. And then the 3D printable parts are actually quite straightforward. It's just a matter of uh, orienting the servos in the correct way and then making everything fit. So we'll have a look at all the different parts uh, in a second. And then it's going to be powered by an RP2040 based board from Pimroni, which is the Servo 2040. I've got one just here. So the Servo 2040, you can see at the top there, it's got 18 servo headers. So we're one short of what we need, uh, but I'm pretty sure we can make that work if we need to. The head one doesn't require much juice to, uh, to move around, uh, but that's going to be the main board that we're going to use. And um, it's going to be able to detect movement with the ultrasonic rangefinder. So if it sees something in front of it, it can sort of do a gesture or you can maybe wave your hand in front of it a certain distance and it will do various different things. Uh, and I want it to be capable of walking. I want it to be able to sort of point at things with its little hand. I want it to be able to sort of clap, uh, wave. Uh, I want it to be able to run and crawl and do all sort of funny uh, animations and things. So that's kind of what I'm shooting for with this. So at the moment, it's just a bare robot. There isn't any code yet. Uh, and the other thing you might have just noticed then is it's called the uh, cute interactive, <laughs> what did I call it? The cute humanoid interactive pal. There we go. Cute humanoid interactive pal chip. Bit of a backronym, but yeah, that's what it's called. So let's have a look at the electronic parts that we need. So like I said, it's uh, quite simple electronically. We just need 19 DS929MG servos. Now you could redesign the, the servo holders and all the different part measurements to make it fit any size of servo, but these are just the ones that I've gone for for this project. Um, it needs the Pimroni Servo 2040 board. If you're thinking about buying one of those, make sure you use Kevin in the, uh, the discount code when you check out and that'll give a little bit of kickback to the show, like a tiny amount, but it's worth doing. Uh, it needs a HCRSR04, can read that then, uh, rangefinder, that's the ultrasonic rangefinder, and that's the 3.3 uh, volt version of that. And there'll be a battery pack. I'm not sure which one I'm going to use yet. It might well be, if I just grab this one from over here, I might well be one of these um, 
two power ones, which is essentially like an 18650 inside a nice little enclosure. And if you press the button there, you get like a little indication of how much power is left. This one's uh, flat. Uh, it's been just charging up my Kindle over there. So electronics, pretty simple, not much more to it. Uh, later on, I will probably add an IMU so that it can do some self-balancing. I'm not sure which one I will use yet for that, but um, be a, probably quite a cheap one. So let's get into the 3D design, which is the main part of this show. So the first part we're going to start with is the torso. So this is going to uh, contain all the servos for the main body function. So the left and the right arm, the left and the right leg, and also the neck servo. Um, so this can be screwed together with two M2 screws. Um, actually four M2 screws and, um, and three screws I've put on there, sorry. The M2 screws are for the servos. So um, I'll show you on the overhead uh, how this is sort of looking at the moment. So this is like the torso cover. It's just like a flat piece and you screw there the, uh, the uh, M3 screws. And then the servos themselves, you can see some of these have already got some uh, screws. They're the M2 screws that are holding them in place. So there's a, a servo missing there for the head head hasn't got his servo on just yet but we can see what one of the arms one of the legs and i've also sort of printed at the same time the other half in red but that isn't assembled uh, just yet so he's a working progress there so that's the the main torso this is what it looks like with the uh, the servo pieces in there as you can see it's got the five servos and they fit really nicely as you can see from the overhead um, there's a little hole in the back and all the wires can go from the inside um, out through there so it fits all together very nicely okay so next up we have a little mention about GrabCAD. So we're going to look at this uh, in the demo slightly later on. Uh, what I wanted to show you is if you go over to GrabCAD.com, there's a whole community library there of 3D printable parts and 3D models that you can grab that people have designed and submitted. I think I've designed and submitted a few, uh, but there's oh, thousands of them. I've got to say hundreds of thousands, but thousands of designs. I think it might be in the tens of thousands. Uh, 3D assets that you can download for free. You simply just have to register with their site. Um, I'm not affiliated with them in any way. This is just a really nice community site that's worth uh, visiting. And then you can download those files. We'll try this uh, in a moment in Fusion 360. And then you can bring them into your design and do things with them. So they're really, really uh, quick to, to get your models up and running if you wish. So this helps mocking up your design. And I want to call that out because we're going to have a look at that uh, in a moment or two. So grabcad.com. Okay, so next up we have the torso cover. So this is just this simple piece on the front there. And uh, this just protects the servos. It screws in with four M2 screws and it even features a little belly button just there because why not? <laughs> so that'd be an unusual weird thing to include in the robot. And then later on people have said like, why don't you make that the charging port or something? <laughs> That's just getting weirder, I think. So the shoulder piece next, um, this is going to be similar to what's going to be like the hip pieces and the left and right shoulder are simply a mirror of each other. And this connects the, the arm servo to the torso and connects the arm assembly, which we're going to have a look at as well. Okay, we've got Marlene on the uh, the chat as well. Hi, Marlene. Hope everything's going okay. So, uh, yes, get better soon. <laughs> Your all-inclusive accommodation. Love it. So if you like what I do and you want to help me uh, continue doing these things, make sure you give this video a like, drop a comment, let me know if uh, if you're going to create a robot with a belly button and also make sure you subscribe to the show as well. It really helps the show grow. And I do go live every single Sunday at 7 o'clock um, UK local time, which is uh, either GMT in the winter or BST, British summer time um, in the summer months. So if you're watching this live now, hey, uh, we've got quite a few people watching live as well, haven't we? Uh, like 30 odd people i think and uh, yes we have merch so i'm wearing some merch at the moment this is the um the robot maker hat we have the uh, the amazing mug we've sold quite a few of these little mugs they are really uh, i think they're the best way to drink uh your beverage and i'm also wearing the um the t-shirt this is a burger bot t-shirt on the back it says kev's robots so you get these in all sizes all colors as well i think alex has got one on as well she's got the boobo one on actually Go full screen for a second there. There we go. <laughs> That's the uh, Google and kezrobots.com on the back. Thank you for modeling that, Alex. <laughs> cool um so that's the merch so you can check out that by going to kezrobots.com slash merch if you want to get or any of those things we have notepads as well okay so let me go over to here 
So the arm assembly, let's have a look at this next. So this connects the arm servo on the torso uh, to the, the rest of the arm and it holds two servos. So let me just grab this one here. I've got the red one that's just here. I've not cleaned up all the print on this one yet. Uh, but essentially it's just like a little little piece that can hold in, just you can see on the screen there, but that's what it looks like. It's got two kind of pockets for the servos to sort of sit in. So they'll sit in there and if you need to, you can screw them in place as well. Now you don't actually have to screw them in place. Um, simply they, they, they fit so well in there, they kind of snap into place. And also the fact that it's being pivoted um, on the top and the bottom, because on the very bottom of this piece, uh, there's like a little nodule, if I can sort of show you that. It's like a little nodule just there and that means that we can, uh, can pivot on those points and they're aligned with the server the servo spindle so that it'll pivot nicely on there so that's all we need to have it's a very simple piece to print that one uh, and that's the upper arm assembly this is what it looks like with the two servos sort of loaded into it you can see the orientation of the spindle of sort of the furth furthest extrament of the uh, extrament furthest extremes of the uh, the servo holder Okay, next up we have the um, the arm um, assembly being fitted to the torso, so you can see there how that sort of fits together, and uh, the hand will fit onto the very end of that. So this is what the hand looks like, it's just like a little little shape, and when we've got two of them it can do like a cute kind of clap thing. I've um, got one of the red one just here, so you can see what they look like, and there's essentially just a mirror shape of them from the left and the right hand. So they're not particularly designed to grip anything really, it's just uh, to look cute. It's a cute robot, that's what we're going for. Next up we've got the hip, so this is going to be the uh, the, the leg assembly is going to fit to the hip. And if you remember, the, they've got the two servos inside that pointing down, so they give a bit of um, degree of freedom in that kind of orientation, so it can spin round. And the legs have got a lot of degrees of freedom because we want them to be uh, as movable as possible. So next up we've got this upper leg double coupler. So this is an unusual part because, let me just grab the, uh, the part here, uh, because it can hold two servos pointing in opposite directions, so in a kind of 90 degree juxtaposition. So if I try and hold this without dropping it, show, show you on the camera, if I get hide my face, it should come into view there, so you can see there's kind of a, two pockets for each of the servos, and there's also two corresponding little, um, pivot points on each of them as well so you can just see the one there and one there it's very shiny filament i've got this i don't know where i got this from but very very shiny so this holds them at 90 degrees from each other and that means that we can have it almost like a universal joint so it can pivot in one direction and also the other direction uh, no top cover is required for either of these points because these parts because um, they're held in place by another piece so that kind of just holds everything together it just means these there's like less work for you to do um, and we use two of these on each leg so there's like an upper part on the leg and the lower part on the leg that use both of these and it gives us uh, two degrees of freedom so that's what it looks like with the uh, the servos loaded you can see there the servos are at uh, 90 degrees from each other so pretty cool uh, so the knee coupler so this is uh, similar to what we've just looked at with the double coupler but this just um, essentially has the the um, the pivot point for one the hinge uh, and also has another pivot point in the same line for the next servo down uh, and, it, and the way that it's just designed there it's just for space um, so this is the sort of knee coupler so it's hinged at 90 degrees uh, from the other one then we've got the shin piece so this one connects the to the lower foot and it's also got this little bar across let me just grab that piece there so this is what this looks like. It's got this little bar across here and that can also limit the movement a little bit. So if I get that the right way round, so it's like, that's the front. Let me show you that there. So that will actually prevent it from bending the wrong way so the knee doesn't sort of bend forward you know, like some ostrich or something. It just bends the correct way. Um, but it also just gives it some rigidity. Otherwise it'd just be two pieces. We'd have to somehow attach them. Uh, but by being attached on a single one means that we've got a little bit of give. We can sort of bend this a little bit to get the servos in place. Uh, but it keeps together nicely. So that's kind of what it looks like as a, an assembly on the, uh, the foot. Okay, so that's the, the shin. It's a movement limiter. Then we have the lower leg. So this is another one of the double couplers like we looked at a second ago. Connects the shin to the foot and holds two extra servos. So uh, that's what it looks like with the servos fully loaded there. And 
let's have a look at the last piece there that's the foot so the foot completes the assembly we have the uh, the foot there we can see i've got a, a red one and a blue one and um, it does kind of have a bit of a, an orientation to it so you can see that it's kind of kind of a flat bit of the, the back and the front's got a round bit and um, it's kind of balanced in such a way hopefully that it'll uh, work so that means that we can we can move it's a very tight fit this one i'll probably have to re-engineer this one a little bit so it can move side to side uh, and it can also move up and down like a, a kicking foot so that's that one i'd like so so when I go to the overhead we can see uh, kind of how all that fits together as an assembly so we've got the the arm there we've got the torso we've got the head just floating at the moment we've got all the other bits and pieces there ready to receive their servos i have actually got 19 servos uh, but i am gonna have to um i'm gonna have to salvage some of them from one of my other robots which is the uh, the bunny robot which i think is at the back just over there next to r2d2 so this is what it looks like as the uh, completed uh, leg assembly. So it's got five servos in each leg, six degree of freedom, including the hip servo, which is inside the uh, the main torso. And this is what the full body assembly looks like. So we've got 18 servos in the full body, um, if we exclude the neck piece. And the hands can touch, their legs can sit and crawl and stand, and hopefully they'll be able to walk without falling over. And then we've got the headpiece. So the headpiece um, holds the ultrasonic rangefinder. So I've got the headpiece just here. So it looks like like this. We can just see there we've got the ultrasonic rangefinder just inside. I could probably make a little back piece to cover that up as well. It's also got a hole at the bottom for the, the servo to go through. Now I've engineered these in such a way, looking to see if I've got one, that you can take one of these little servo horns. So I've got this servo horn here and that has a tiny little round um, thing that goes over the, the spindle. And that means that if the spindle is like five millimeters typically on a servo, this is about seven millimeters. So we need to include some clearance for that on any part that this sits inside. And then that can simply sit inside the, the head and we can then screw in if we need to any extra parts. I'll see if I can, uh, I've not actually done this before, but I'll see if that will, no, I'll, I'll need to trim that one down a little bit, but essentially uh, that'll be able to fit into into that piece uh, with a bit of a bit of force. Okay, so the full assembly it looks like this. We have the range finder in the head. The head can turn 180 degrees, so 90 degrees is the middle point, so minus 90 and plus 90, uh, and that means it can look around. It hasn't got like an up and down that would require like an extra extra bit of height, I guess, for the neck, and also um, an extra servo. We will be up to 20 servos at that point. Okay, so some future plans for this, because obviously this is like work in progress. This is hot off the press this week. I think I only started looking at this on maybe Wednesday, Thursday this week. So we need to design a walking cycle for this robot. Uh, we'll need an IMU, uh, an inertial measurement unit to be able to measure his orientation in three dimensional space. So he knows if he's stood up or fallen down or if he's falling, he can move his arms and so on. I also want to be able to do some fun animations uh, and behaviours so that it can, uh, it can, like I said, clap, it can wave, it can do chef kisses, it can do all that kind of stuff. So he hasn't got a mouth, but he can, he can do it from where his mouth would be. Uh, and of course, I want to design an entire MicroPython library for Chip, so it makes it really easy to use Chip and to um, string all the animations together into some kind of sequence. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a course as well on how to build this, similar to what I did for BurgerBot, uh, and that'll be on kevsrobots.com slash learn once I've uh, finished the build and made everything sort of test fit correctly. Okay, so if you haven't joined me on Discord already, make sure you head over to Discord um, by going to kezrobots.com slash Discord and getting signed up there. And you can join our community of people uh, who are all signed up there. And um, if you've not already checked out the how it works, you can also go there. I, the latest one I did was the H-Bridge, how H-Bridges work. We looked at uh, breadboards and LED strips, batteries. There's a whole load of things there. So these are nice little uh, how-to articles uh, and with some extra resources there too. Uh, and if you've not followed me on social media already, check out, um, I'm on TikTok at Kevin McAleer 6 uh, I'm at uh, Kevin McAleer on Instagram, I'm um, at KevsMac on Twitter, and also on KevsMac at Mastodon Social. Um, you can find me there as well. So let me just go and have a quick sneaky peek of uh, what my next slide is, because I want to make sure um, 
Yes, so what we need to do now is go over to Fusion. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up uh, Fusion 360 and we're going to have a play around with uh, uh, GrabCAD and grabbing some files off that and then loading it into Fusion. So if I go over here, I've got um, Chip. This is the model I've been uh, playing with. You can see all the different components there. We've got all the components are lined up uh, and it's quite a complicated um, project to put things together like this. There's so many different parts. But conceptually, it's actually very simple to build something like this. And this is what I wanted to sort of show you today in the in the demo. So let's create a new design and uh, let's let's design something that's going to use a servo, I think, for example. Now, I want to build this using a servo that I brought in from a third party. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go over here for a second. Let's load up that and I'm going to go over to grabcad.com. So if I go over to here. I go to grabcad.com. I've actually logged into this. You, you'll need to create yourself an account, uh, but you can see I've uh, logged on there. And I'm going to go up to the library and I'm going to go to the search bar and then I'm going to search for Servo SG90. Press return. And then let's have a see what we've got. So I like the look of this one here, this servo motor. So I'm going to click on that one and it shows you a bit of a preview what it looks like and then i'm going to download the files and it's going to download the files that you can see there so now that's downloaded if i uh, show that in finder if i just open that up uh, and then we've got the, the folder itself the folder has got um, an image and it's also got this dwg file this drawing file so if i now go back to, F to fusion 360 and i go up to the file and upload we can now upload that file that we've just downloaded into our library, into our online library. So I'm going to pick the DWG. I don't need the, the PNG. I could upload that as well, but I don't need to do that. And um, so it's got this thing ready to go. So if I now click upload, it's now going to upload that. And uh, it just takes it a couple of seconds to do that. So while it's doing that, you can see it's halfway through that. I'll close this dialog box. I'll open up this data panel here. And you can see there it says servo motor SG90 loading. So that's the one that we've just downloaded. We've now uploaded it to Fusion 360 in the cloud. And that means it's ready to use in our project. So one of the things that we can do with things that we've downloaded, we can import them, insert them into our projects, and then we can manipulate them, we can use them, we can measure them, we can do all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but before we import anything, if I try right clicking and insert into current design, it's going to complain and say that I've not saved my file yet. So what I need to do is click save and we need to give this a name. So let's call it live stream. Um, so we'll hold us, something like that. And I can now, you can see the live stream server holders just been created there. So if I now right click and insert into current design, it's going to appear just underneath this origin thing here as a new part. And I can manipulate it. I can do all kinds of things like that. I can grab this, move it around. You can see there all the different, just behind my head, all the different measurements as I'm sort of pulling this around the X and the Y position and everything changes. Now we don't want to change the scale, we just want to keep uh, that okay. And it actually doesn't matter what where we put it, because what we're going to do is we're going to lock it into another design in a minute. So uh, what I will do, let's come back to me for a second, I'm going to close this data panel down. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on this little eyeball here, and that's going to hide it for a second. So that sort of enables and disables the, uh, the view of that. And if I just scroll back a second, that point there, that little cookie in the middle, that is our origin. I'm going to design something at that origin and that's going to enable me to um, to snap things to that. So what I'm going to do, um, we use assemblies a lot in Fusion 360 and this is a recommended way. I could just go straight away and create a new sketch and build everything out here, but it would make it really difficult later on to manipulate that and move it around and link it to other things. So it's always best to create a new assembly. So I'm going to create a new component and I'm going to call this one um, let's call it servo holder and it doesn't matter what we call it we can actually change the name later on and you can see some other options we've got there it's a standard one it's not a sheet metal external means you can actually save it as an external project file and bring that in as a sort of linked um, uh, component but for now I'm just going to say internal so it's internal to this project we will look at the external ones uh, in a moment let me just bring up my notes over there and what I'm going to do now is um, I'm just going to keep that uh, servo holder, sorry, the servo motor hidden. 
and the servo holder is the one that we've currently got active and that little uh, radio button there uh, means that that's the active component i think by default the root is the active component but i just want to be working just on this servo holder so we need to create a sketch so i'm going to create a sketch and i'm simply going to create a rectangle first of all and this is going to be where we can drop our servo into it's going to be like a, a hole for this to go through kind of making this up on the fly so i'm going to click on the the rectangle I want this to be a center rectangle, which means that wherever I click will be the middle. So if I click on that origin point, you can see now that it's sort of growing and shrinking. So let's say, for example, I don't know how big my servo is. I happen to know how big servos are because I work with them so much, but say I didn't know that, uh, we could just click there. And what we've ended up with is a rectangle which isn't constrained in any way. So it's constrained by that very center point there. That's what these little, uh, it looks like an L. These are these um, contingent, uh, coincident constraints and it's coincident to the origin, but the, the actual size and the width have not been defined. And this is where bringing in things from like GrabCAD can really help because you can actually look at that model and then work out what they are. So if we go back to uh, this servo motor and I just click on the eyeball and I zoom back a little bit, we can see that the servo is sort of hiding over there almost like a, a ghost, um, like a, a ghost person on Star Wars. And if I click on there, I can see how wide that is. So it says down there 11.8. So a good guess for most servos, I've got a, a variety of servos in my hand here. So I've got one of the SG90s, I've got an MG90, and I've also got this one that isn't branded. Well, actually it is branded. Um, this is a Tower Pro one, so it's quite a good quality one. It's metal, it's got a metal gearing in it. Now they're all very, very similar in size, but are they exactly the same? What we would have to do is get our trusty calipers out and measure them. So let me just grab this. I want to show you this, just be going off at a tangent for a second. So this is my digital caliper. That's the coin cell battery that uh, powers it. And I've lost the cover. I think I've dropped it and the cover's come off. So I actually have to press that with my thumb, reset it, <clears throat> and then I can then measure things. So let's measure the thir first one. So 11.8 is what our model thinks it'll be. That one is almost exactly 12. You can see there 12 millimeters let's get the uh, the mg one that's 12.2 let's just make sure let's reset try again 12.2 12. yeah 12.2 and then we've got the sg90 which is the the plasticky one let's measure that and that's 12.3 let's just make sure that's reset yep 12.3 so between 11.8 and 12.2 three is probably what we're aiming for anything else will be a tight fit we can also measure the uh, that orientation so 27.76 oh, let's measure that one again 22.64 let's measure that one there so that one is 22.95 so pretty much 23 and let's measure the width of that one as well so that one is also 23.17 so they're all about 23 that's kind of the width that we're expecting that to be so that's what's really great about uh, being able to bring the model in we can then look at the the width so 23 was what a lot of them were wide and we can see just down at the bottom here it says the length is 22.5 and the width is 18 sorry 11.8 so we need to make sure our hole is something like that if it's going to work. So I always like to go with, let me just grab that edge there. If I press D for dimension on the edge, I can then dimension this properly. So I can say this is 23 by 12. And that should be good enough for most of the servos that I use. The, the DS929MG ones, these dimensions work perfectly. So 23 by 12. Uh, is perfect for that next i want to give this some kind of thickness so i'm going to click on this offset i'm going to click on that outside edge and i want that to be about two millimeters thick now if i'm going to use that same thickness throughout all my projects what i can do is i can create like a variable to hold that so this parameters if i click on that i can actually create a new user parameter and i can call this one um servo you know, let's, let's call this one thickness let's make it three three millimeters if i click ok i can actually go into the model parameters of the sketch that i've just created and where that two millimeter one is i can actually change that to be thickness 
and it'll now change that to three millimeters. And if I click OK, we can now see it's now referring to that thickness. That's what that little FX means. It means it's a parameter that's being used and the thickness is uh, the name of the parameter and it's three millimeters thick. So that gives a really nice uh, tight uh, fit around the servos. So let me just see if I've got somewhere on my desk there is a little blue rectangle but I can't find it. Nope, I've not got that to hand. Okay, that's fine. So this will do for one single servo. Now, say we wanted to have two servos, we wanted to do that thing where one's at 90 degrees and one's at the other angle. What we could do, I found that 24 works best for that, and we can basically just create another um, line, another rectangle down here. So I just pressed R to create a rectangle. Let me just do that again very quickly to show you. So I pressed R on the keyboard. So wherever I click now, it'll draw the rectangle. But if I start from um, a point, can you see how it sort of has a little blue square that appears on that corner there. It recognizes that there's a point there that we can attach to. So if I click on that and I just drag out this to be whatever, just let go. And then I grab that corner there just by pressing and then dragging. I can then drag that little lock. It'll snap to the other point there. Now, if I want that line and that line to be exactly the same, there's actually a constraint for that that's called equals. If we click on equals and we click on that other line, they are now exactly the same size. And you can see this little uh, equals thing here uh, is matching that equals there. Now, it doesn't think we've uh, snapped that properly, so I'm just going to make sure that does snap in place. Uh, so let me just zoom in a little bit there. So that needs to snap in place to there. There we go. It's now changed to the color black, which means it's fully defined. Everything is locked in and constrained to the origin, and that means it's not going to go anywhere. Now, what we also need to do is extend um, this outline around so this thing that we created before so if i click on that line i can actually make that um, a construction line just by clicking over here or if i just select it and press x on the keyboard that does the same thing and you can also notice when i press x on there the, the sort of infill changes so that's a fully defined profile anything that's got that light blue it means there's it's kind of watertight there's no gaps in your design if i press x it's um, now a construction line and it's not a solid line so it's now no longer part and if you imagine that uh, we did like a flood fill on here uh, water would get into there so what we need to do is just draw three lines so if i snap to that one there if i just drag, drag these and draw a really bad shape it's not at all um, square to those other points uh, and I also need to make them just uh, not construction lines, so press X on them to make them solid. And you can see there that they're blue, they're light blue, the colour of the lines, and that means that they're not fully constrained yet. So you can, there's some element to it like that. If I move it, it's moving around, it isn't locked in place. If I grab this line up here, for example, and move my mouse around, nothing changes because it's locked in place. So what I need to do is I need to constrain these. And there's a number of different ways I can constrain this. I can either click on this one. This line above here, I can make it so that it's um, collinear to it. So if I click on that, uh, click on the collinear tool and click on that, that line and that line are now completely in line with each other. Another way to do this, because that line is actually completely vertical. So if I click on the line that I want to be vertical, I can click on this little horizontal vertical constraint and that makes that uh, completely vertical. And then the other thing I could do, I could make these, um, the bottom line also um, horizontal using that horizontal vertical constraint, or I could make um, it perpendicular, which means it's a, a right angle to another, another line. I've got a really itchy nose. Uh, so if I click on this uh, perpendicular constraint and then I click on that line and that line, they are now, you can see in the little corner there, we've got that little, it looks like a T, it means perpendicular and it means that those lines are completely now locked in. So what I can then do finally is, let's see what we need this to be. I need the, the gap between that line and that line to be the thickness. So if I do D for dimension, and I click on both of those lines, so if I just click on that bottom line there, drag this out, you can see there that we've got, um, uh, it's asking for what's the dimension of this. And if I type in thickness, or I even start typing it, press return, that will now be the same thickness all the way round. Now we can actually change that other line just there to be a construction line too. And there's two lines that are actually over the top of each other occupying the same space there. And that's why that still looks solid. So if I click and hold this little um, 
box appears here and we can actually click on each individual one so we can see that one has got the construction line so if i click on it and hold again we can then select the second line and then that one isn't a construction line so i can make that one just by pressing x or clicking on this line type over here so what we've now got is a kind of square hoop which is just big enough to fit two servos in side by side so that's the first sketch done if i click ok uh, we can see over here now we have our our sketch design so we need to make it thick we need to bring it to life by giving it some thickness so if i just press e for extrude and then select the profile uh, i can now use this arrow to sort of give it some thickness we could even type in thickness as our variable which will make it three millimeters thick and you can see now that this is a uh, this is sort of floating around in uh, in space so what we can do to stop it doing that floating around thing we can uh, we can right click on it um, so it's not right click so it's clicking on the actual component and then grounding it and that will make it um, make it solid so if I try and click and drag now um, it means now that we can't actually move it it's solid so if I now go back to the top of the components here this um, the root there of our design we can now see that we have our our servo over here and we have our sort of servo holder um, locked into place and I want to put this inside there and I want that servo to be locked into place to this servo holder. So let's have a think about how we can do that. I think what I might do, what I might do is I might have a look at these two holes and see how far apart are these two holes. Normally I, I think they're about 29 uh, apart. That one says the 25.3 from the very inside edges of the design. So 25.3, let's remember that. We can go back to... Um, our servo holder I actually go back to that click on that little active button there and you can see we've got the sketch if I double click on that let's create some screw holes so I'm going to create a circle and another circle let's make these uh, two uh, millimeters each so I can either just click on that and say two I'm doing D for dimension as well clicking on the edge or if I wanted to I could just click on the other design over there and it recognizes this as being dimension number eight. So the dimensional value will match. It'll be linked to that one there. So if this one changes to say four, this one also changes to four. So let's change that one back to two. And I'm gonna draw a line, just press L, or you can press this button up here. And I'm gonna press it right from the very center of both of these, link them together. I'm gonna to click on it and then press X to make it uh, a construction line and then I'm going to click on that horizontal vertical constraint and that means now that these are sort of tied together and um, you can see I can move them about but wherever one height is the other one will be the same so I'm going to click on um, what we need to do next is draw another line um, vertically down make these constructions as well just by pressing X over them and then we're then going to use this tangent constraint. So this is really useful for anything that has circles in it. So if I make that line tangent to that one, can you see what's happened there? If I uh, zoom in, I can get my fusion to behave correctly. Let me just spin that back round. Let's zoom right back in on that. You can see now this line is, and they've got a little circle with a line. It looks like an A on its side, but it's um, a circle with a line attached to it. So wherever this line goes, that circle will, will follow from that side that we've picked. Okay, so what I need to do is just do the same for the other one. So let me just, ugh, fusion behave. Right, so let's just zoom in on that one there. So I'll grab the line, press the tangent constraint, click the outside of the circle. And now what we can do is we can press D for dimension and then draw a dimension between those two lines. And it was 23.5, I think. Uh, and that's the distance between the two um, um, mounting holes on the servo. So it doesn't actually matter if these lines are physically touching or not. They'll always be tangent to, but I always think it's nice to just make sure they, they physically look like that. But these are just for helping us construct our drawing we can't see them when we uh, we go out of the sketch so what i'm now going to do we can now use another constraint which is called the midpoint constraint this is this triangle and what this will do is it will find the middle of a component such as this line so the very very middle here and i'm going to snap it to the origin point which happens to be halfway in between if i just zoom in on it a little bit halfway between the top and the the bottom of this 
particular piece where the servo is going to fit. So if I click on that, click on our midpoint and then click in there, we can now see we've got the, the holes, which um, is that right? That looks a bit different to me, but it's probably because I've got this 24 apart rather than the 22 and a half, which I think the other servos were. So we could actually make that one 22.5, I think it was. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. That'll be a very, very tight fit. We'll talk about tolerances in a second. So if I finish that sketch now, what this means if I go back to the root, I can now flip over here. I can zoom in on this little circle here on the very bottom and I can press this joint and this will create a, a, a connection between one component and another component. So if I just flip that round, uh, zoom out a little bit, I'm just using the mouse to zoom out. Oh, and we didn't actually create the holes for this. That that doesn't help. So let me just cancel that joint a second. What we need to do there is go back to our servo holder, switch on that sketch that we just created. I'm going to flip it over and then I'm just basically just going to push extrude out those two holes. If I just go E to extrude, uh, can revert that position. That's fine. Click on that, click on that and then push up. We don't need that middle bit. So what's going to happen is it's going to extrude those two holes up. You can see that it's going to do it. We, we can we can either type in the distance either as like the thickness in this little dialog box there or another way to do it is we can click on that distance and just say all and it will figure out where the end is and if there's no components beyond that point. And the objects are cut, it's currently just this body, so that's fine. So if we cut that, we've now got two holes. If I zoom back and then zoom back in, you can see now we've got these two holes. If I switch off that sketch, you can also see the holes there. Right, so that now means we can now lock in place our servo. So let me grab that as well. Interesting, they've got a little thing sticking out here for the, the cables. That's something that always you have to remember. But let's, let's grab this one here. So I'm going to say joint because I'd already selected that. That's the first component. And then the second component we want to join this to is going to be that other hole over there. So let me just go over there and you can see as I move my mouse over to it, it kind of has a black selection to say that's there. And if we just use this little cube to rotate round, let me just move everything back spin it around on the spot, move that out of the way so we can see what we're doing. That looks exactly right to me. That looks what we want to happen. So let's click OK. Now it does look like this is ever so slightly off center. Can you see there's a gap there on that side and on this side, this means it's actually cutting into the other one because it hasn't got like a nice black outline. It's got kind of a, um, there's no um, black outline like here between these two things and that means that uh, they're intersecting which is not great so I'm just going to click OK for now and then I'm going to fix that so let me just click on this top edge make a note down there so it's 22.5 that's the thickness of the servo but then the distance between let's let's just check that out again I'm going to click on the servo I'm going to click on this little look at button here and that helps me have a really good look at it. Oh, I actually want to look at it from the top. And what I want to do is get it in the center of my screen. I want to click on that circle there and then click on that circle again. So 25.3, I didn't type 25.3. So what I can do, I can actually go back in that change parameters box and I can find, I did 23.5 instead of 25.3. Let's just correct that, click OK. Uh, so now when we look at our model, let's spin that around there. That looks completely correct. You can now see there is a black line between this component and that component. If I just move my mouse out of the way, uh, and that means that uh, they're not inter intersecting anymore. So that's now sat perfectly on the, the, uh, the servo holder. Now this isn't a great design, this one, because you can see that they're actually cutting through and uh, there's no material either side of them. So we can fix that very quickly just by changing the value of that thickness. Let's make it five millimeters instead. Click OK. And now this is bulked out uh, because we've parameterized things. This is parametric modeling for you. And uh, you can see there that, that that servo is nicely fitting into that servo holder. So we've done quite a few different things there. We've uh, we've created an, um, 
a component we've grounded it so that it locks into place and if i try and grab this whole thing now if i'm clicking and dragging nothing is moving at all that's absolutely rock solid uh, it's not going to go anywhere um, and that's because the joint that we made a little uh, it looks like a little mortise joint thing there together if we click on that edit the joint the type of joint that we made is a rigid joint so if i do that little animation it sort of shakes to sort of say that's not going anywhere that's uh, absolutely rock solid we could have made it a revolute one so it would spin round on the point there uh, which we don't want to do there is a slider one so it can slide up and down that that's not really what we wanted this to be uh, there's a cylindrical one so it sort of moves around that cylinder uh, and you can specify which access there's a pin slot uh, what else have we got we've got the planer and we've got one last one which is ball so it can spin around all areas like that but we wanted this to be rigid so it sort of locks into place so let's create one more component and i'll show you why this is so if i don't create a component if i forget and i'm in the root uh, you can see i've got the root selected there and i go straight to create a sketch and i just create a sketch i don't know on there and let me just create um something really boring like a little cube so we can make this square by clicking on that making that equal to that one so that they're always the same and then let's just make this i don't know 10 click ok now I, first of all i can't see that sketch because the other things are in the way so what i could do is i could hide them just by clicking on the eyeballs to get rid of them um, or if we were working on just say the servo holder you can right click and say isolate and that hides everything else other than that one and it means you don't have to go and click all the eyeballs one at a time um, and then you can just go unisolate to do, undo that but in this case um, i actually want to hide both of them just so that i can see this and then i want to extrude this out by um, we made it 10 didn't we and if i just move that round you can see what it's doing is it's extruding it from the one plane outwards but i want it to be the origin to be completely in the middle of that so rather than just saying one side i can drop this little drop down here if i move me out of the way i can then say make it symmetrical and the measurement is the whole length like that so it's 10 and we can see now that the starting point is in the middle and it's kind of going either side out so let's click ok and it's going to create a new body as well now i might think oh no i didn't mean to do that what i wanted to have done is created a new component and have the sketch in there so it's never too late to do this we can go back over here we can create a new component let's call this one uh, cube so we've got cube as a new component but our sketch and our bodies are sat down here so there's the the body sketch so there's the body sketch there and there's the body body so we can actually just drag the sketch into that cube and sometimes it will let you do this sometimes it won't let's try dragging the body into there that's okay will it let me drag the sketch now so it's not letting me drag the sketch there's a little error message that's just popping up behind me that just says some features downstream of this um will be affected if you do this so um what we could do we can basically wind back on our timeline if i go back up to the top here uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen we've got this timeline of all the things that we've done to build up our project to date uh, and we can actually wind history back just by dragging this little timeline thing so if i go back to just before we dragged out the cube so it's just the sketch everything beyond that point we can uh, we can we can see doesn't exist yet so let's actually go and delete all those things so i'm going to delete the component we just created I'm just right clicking on these delete the actual body um, and then we're just left with a sketch so at this point i could now create that new assembly that new component sorry and call it cube i can now drag that sketch into the cube and that works fine and i've i've selected the cube now and i can then drag that out like we did before using that extrude make it symmetrical uh, just move me out of the way again so you can see that's going on there and then make it the measure and make it 10 so there we go okay let's go back to there and if we hide the sketch you uh, you can't see that anymore right so we can now go back and we can unhide all the other bits and pieces so that cube is currently floating inside the other components which isn't great so what we can do we can click on that cube we can um, in fact let's click on the the root first 
then, then click on the cube but not selecting it as a component and then I'm going to press M or you can use this move copy button up here while that's selected so if I press M I've now got this little uh, thing I can move the cube out the way so I can actually see it and as I'm moving it with these arrows you can actually see there the X Y and Z positions are all being adjusted as I do that so I could if I if I wanted to the, that to be an exact amount like 10 uh, by 10 by 10 I can type those into this little dialog box here which is just behind my head so 10 by 10 by 10 or I can just grab this uh, and put it wherever I think looks about right so that's now floating about we'd have to capture the position if we want that position to be captured in our timeline so that we can always go back to that point um, but now we can we can do things like attach that to say the top of that spindle there for example so let me go back to my notes here so one of the things I wanted to show you was about tolerances so I'm going to hide that sketch so I want this servo to go inside this cube we've just created so I'm going to go back to my cube and I'm going to create on the very top here just a new sketch and this new sketch is going to have a circle so I press C for circle I go to the origin point and drag this out so I know my servo spindle is five millimeters so I'm going to press five there finish the sketch I'm going to show the sketch over here just the second one and you can name these sketches as well so you could just call that one um, like initial cube sketch and you could call this one like the uh, hole or the servo like that and that means it's easier to figure out what's going on so now I'm going to click on that profile there I'm going to press E and I'm going to extrude it down about five millimeters so minus five i'll type in there and you can see what's going to happen it's going to cut out the operation is cut so we're going to end up with a hole there there we go so we've now got this hole and we've got the servo there let's just see what they think that is 4.6 is what they've got as their measurement i'm going to grab my uh my calipers and i'm just going to measure what i think this one is so this one is four point 4.7, 4.8, something like that. Let's grab another one. See if this is any different. This is a metal one this time. This one it thinks is just 4.7. So 4.6, it's small, um, maybe too small. So what I tend to like to do, depending on what I'm working with, uh, if I'm creating a general model, I might make things um, um, a midway between the, the, all the different sizes that something could be so the different servo sizes I might take a measurement of all of them if I know I'm working with one that definitely has like a five millimeter spindle then that's what I'll I'll make my spindle measurement be but then the whole size I will actually make that be whatever the spindle size is plus 0.1 millimeters and that's the tolerance that will mean that it's a good fit but it's not too tight it's got a bit of play in there um, so what we can do on here is we can go to that change parameters uh, we can find the cube component and we can find the hole for the servo sketch which is here and I've said that's five so if I make that 5.1 then that that hole is now 5.1 in diameter you can just see under my head over here it says one edge diameter is 5.1 and I can now create um, if I select the root so I can now move these about I can grab this I can click create joint I can select that first um, circle here and then I want the second one to be that inner circle there so it's gonna if I flip that over I just move my head out of the way for a second there's a little flip thing here and that means you can mean you can flip the the normal the orientation that this is actually pointing in uh, and now that's the one I want it to be and I also want this to be a revolute so that it'll spin round nicely so if I click OK now I've now created something I can grab hold of in Fusion 360 and spin around and uh, make it do whatever I need to do. And I've got my screw holes. I could even bring in some screws. There's a really nice um, library on here. If I get onto the insert that's called the McMaster Car Component Library. So if I bring this up, I can actually type in something like uh, an M2 screw. Let's go for M screw, M2 screws. And you can also see here it's got all the different lengths uh, so you know between the the end and the underneath of the, the head end or all the way across or just that measurement there uh, we've got all the different types that we can have the different 
head types, rounded, flat, headless, and so on. And you can use these to uh, to decide what you want. So you might think, well, I want the, the rounded one. And I want the hex head, so that's fine. You can have hex, you can have Phillips, you can have slotted. I'm going to go for that one just there. And I'm going to go for the... Uh, sort of silver one so if i scroll down here you can see all the different like this is how you could order them they've got all these like order numbers here if i click on one of those i can then go to here and i can download the step file for that now i don't need to do anything else other than click download and it actually brings the 3d model a bit like grabcad but directly into our project so you can see that this is like a really small screw that we brought in there uh, but now i can i can say okay that's great i can click on the joint can grab that lower edge and I can grab that edge there and we've now got we can we don't need to do a revolute can make that one rigid and we've basically screwed in our components you can see there we've got that little screw uh, it's not quite long enough that one but you, you get the principle there and I can still move this around but everything else is sort of solidly in place I'm trying to click and drag there and it's not letting me do that because um, everything is now solid so we created um, a component there we've grabbed something from GrabCAD we've used the uh, McMaster car uh, component library to, to bring in like screws and nuts and bolts and things like that we've measured things with our calipers to make sure that we uh, we get our measurements just right um, and one of the things somebody asked me the other day was how do I do these really nice uh, designs in um, uh, like on Twitter they look like an Ikea design like this is how everything goes together so let's say we want to create um, some documentation that shows you how to screw this screw into um, this servo let's do that so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the grid I'm going to get rid of the layout grid so it looks like it's just on a white space it's like the matrix the next one I can then do is say the visual style is going to be wireframe with visible edges only. And then the last thing I'm going to do is going to go to object visibility and switch off all the work features. And that's going to get rid of all those um, uh, joints and things like that from being displayed. So now what I've got is like this very nice uh, black and white line drawing. Um, and what I want to do is sort of illustrate that this screw goes into that screw hole. So if we go back to that joint that we just uh, brought in there, if I right click and edit the joint... I can actually just change the offset so this offset here I could basically just make that say minus 10 so that's now floating if I just get the angle of this just right we might not want a perspective drawing we might want like an off off orthogonal view like this um, so there's no perspective being applied uh, that's how these things tend to be shown and that's probably a good enough one so I'm now I'm on a Mac so I'm going to do a screen capture if you're on a Windows um, computer I think you do like uh, is it function print screen and that will bring up this little um, sniping tool I think it's called whereas on a Mac you can do uh, shift command and five and that will bring up a, a little box you can't see it on here but I can see a little box that's going to select the thing I'm interested in I'm going to click capture and that's going to save that file to my desktop so I'm just going to wait for that to finish saving out and I'm going to go to keynote and I'm going to create a new keynote because uh, this is how I do it. I'm just going to click on new. And I've got um, a, a theme that I like to use for all my presentations I've designed. And if I go to the this style, I can then go to the bottom and then there's this nice uh, design. It's kind of got like a gradient view of it. So we can type in here like servo assembly, like so. And then if I go to insert, choose, and we find that... Uh, that file on my desktop that we just created which is that screenshot just there that's the one we're going to bring this in now at the moment it doesn't look great so if I double click this I can actually adjust the uh, uh, the mask on there so that's that's probably good enough and then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on image and I'm going to say remove background now it doesn't always get this right first time so I click reset and then just click again I can then individually click the parts I want it to get rid of okay that looks good and then the last thing that i always think makes this pop is if we go to style and we have a line as the border and it's got a five point line around it uh, you can now see this is looking a bit more like a one of those ikea like let's just move that mask in a bit more uh, drawings we can now stretch that out a bit uh, we can stretch that out a bit more and then we can do something like a shape bring in one of these arrows and then we can rotate that round and just sort of show that seeing that this this goes that way and there we go we've created like a 
an Ikea-like, you present that, there you go, an Ikea-like drawing that shows you how these things fit together. And you can even animate this by just like dropping in an animation and then doing, I don't know, fade and move and make it go from top to bottom. So if we now look at this, it'll now drop that, that arrow in so it looks like, like that. And then if you wanted to export that, you can just go to file, export to, and then say images, and then you basically just say which, which one of the slides, so this slide one, and then, yep, you can then just say export that as a JPEG, and then it will then save that out to wherever you want it to go to. So let's go to there, and let's just call this, I don't know, IKEA-like design. And if we now open up that IKEA-like design, we can see we've got that as a, a JPEG that we can then put onto Twitter and show people how we build things. So it's really great for documenting things. I quite like that style. So I thought I'd uh, show you how to do that. So that's that one. What else have we got on here? Um, so one of the other things I like to do with Fusion 360 is I like to challenge myself with little designs to try and copy. So I will go on to... Um, onto Google and I'll, I'll find like a, a 3D shape that I want to recreate. So say this box shape, I want to recreate this in Fusion 360. How would I go about doing that? So it's got like, it's got a thickness to this edge here. So I might get my calipers out and measure that thickness and you know, see what that ends up being. Take that measurement and then I'll go into Fusion and try and measure that, you know, try and draw that out. And this is a three dimensional shape, but it's quite simple because it's essentially just a rectangle that's been extruded and then there's like another rectangle at the top it has got this little hole in here so maybe we could we could model out the hole as well if I push that through there we can see there's like a little little hole just there and you can even design this as a flat net and then bring it in that that sheet metal design we looked at before where where we said it's either a a standard design or a sheet metal you can design something so that it's a piece of sheet metal and it'll unfold it after you've extruded everything uh, and show you where all the marks are where you need to put it in a sort of bending machine and bend it all out so absolutely love um, challenging myself like that uh, I've shown you about how to isolate parts I'm just looking at my notes here if there's anything else we need to talk about on there excuse me and um, so the last thing I'll show you then was the uh, um, external parts. Before, when we created a new component, a new assembly, we did an, an internal one. We can actually create an external part. Let's call this one, um, um, let's call this one, I don't know, hinge, something like that. So this is, if I just say capture position, that's fine. So this is now going to create another component down here, which is a hinge, and it's doing this edit in place function for us. If I bring out this uh, data panel, uh, if I just save that, even though we've not actually done anything in that assembly yet, the hinge, if I go to save this, it says there are two designs. There's the, the server holder that, uh, that we basically changed from version one to version two by saving it. You can see the version numbers at the top there, like chips on version 26 and the legs on 27. That's why that one needs to be updated. And then the hinge here hasn't been created yet. So if I click OK, we'll see that the hinge gets created as an external component outside of our, our design. And you might want to do that. I, I did this one with chip. I designed the legs and the arms as separate components and then brought them in uh, as an external component. Uh, you can see that it's external because it has this little uh, paper clip kind of thing in front of it. Uh, and that means you can kind of design something without the distraction and complexity and all that history of everything else that's gone on. And you can basically just focus on the one part. Uh, so that's how you do that. The other thing I uh, was going to show you uh, with that um, sketch thing that we just did a second ago, which I forgot to do. If you click on one of the components. So if I click on um, that servo motor, it's turned kind of a blue color. And when we capture that, um, let's go back to capture that. I go back into our keynote. I can basically just replace that image that we've just put in there with the one that's got the, the blue component on it. It just looks nicer, I think. So if I go back up to the desktop, I just insert that one that we just created there. Let's just center that up a bit more like so. Uh, we, we do need to do that remove background once more. Doesn't always get it right. There we go. Oops. Click OK. You can ignore that bit down there. That's uh, we can basically just move the mask to get rid of that. Like so. There we go. 
go let's just move that mask in a bit more there we go that's got rid of that weird thing there and there we go and we can just move the arrow back to there so we've now got that sort of blue highlighted component i also think that just makes it pop a little bit more okay so that's the uh, external components um and then if we just go back in to that design so if we want to edit that hinge we can do it a couple of different ways we can either open up the hinge independently in another window so if i just double click that we've now got the hinge in there we can create a new sketch let's just i don't know do a, a cylinder so we'll do a circle let's make that i don't know 40 click finish and then extrude it up 10 for example like so let's save that so that's now going to be version 2 or version 1 sorry version 1 we now go back to our live stream holder we've now got at the very top here a little yellow triangle and uh, the the link thing and it's saying there you've not got the latest versions if you click on that it's now updated that to be the latest version which is just floating around here because we've not joined it to anything uh, you can see the hinge there is at version 2 uh, and there's one instance of it in our in our drawing um, you can also duplicate objects so if i click on that servo motor i can then click m as if i'm going to move it but i can click on i just drag this over here click on create copy and now if I move it I've actually got two servos so I could then use a second servo in my um, design and you can see there the version 1.1 1, 1 and version 1.2 is the second instance or first and second instance of these uh, uh, servo motors uh, like so that means we can we can go and independently change that design so if i wanted to get rid of that weird cable thing that's on there i could actually open up that servo model get rid of that save it and then when we come back into our other design it will then update that with all the instances that we have in our design so it's a really nice way of working independently even working as a team uh, on one drawing so that's probably enough fusion 360 stuff for today so let me go back to uh, the main slides and not that one let's go back to our chip design let's go back there so we we did the social media stuff hopefully you're all follow me on social media now and if you want to help support the show you can do that in a number of different ways if you're watching this live you can do a super thanks super chat i always get that wrong you can do a super chat right now let me make sure we've got all the widgets switched on for that. Uh, if you're watching this on replay, you can do a super thanks. Uh, there's a little button that just says thanks underneath the main window. And uh, I'll just send a little tip to me via um, YouTube. You can go to kevsrobots.com, buy me a physical coffee, and that will uh, help fill up my empty mug with some uh, nice coffee. I do like to drink coffee every single morning. And you can also join the YouTube membership pro program just by clicking join underneath the main window if you're watching this uh, uh, via youtube so uh, thank you so much to all the people that have joined so far and we can shout out to those people now via our supporters so let's see who we've got so we have somebody buy me a coffee they wanted to remain nameless i get to see their email but i don't necessarily know who that is as a person so thank you for the person that bought me a coffee uh, very recently uh, we've got Roland, he bought me a coffee, I've got three coffees actually, which is very, very generous. And then somebody else did, again, who wanted to be nameless. Then on the buymeacoffee.com uh, membership programs, we had uh, uh, Day and Court uh, join recently. We've got Marlene, we've got John, Tom, Shemi and Steve there as well. Hey Steve, hey uh, Shemi, hey Tom. And then YouTube members, we have uh, Oxrad39, we've got Dale from Hybrid Robotics, we've got Carol, we have Jose, we have uh, Skipper Banks, we have Jeff Ford, Dewey Peabody, Bill Hoy, Hans from Cheerlights, uh, Michael, and of course Tom. So thank you so much for helping support the show. Uh, there we go. And I think that is all for today's show, uh, for the main body of the, the show. So let me go back to the main thing and say thank you so much for watching, and I shall see you next time.